Hello and welcome once again to the STIR series of videos by Dr. Amdekar's team. I am Dr. Tushar Manyar, pediatrician from Andheri, and I'll be talking today on clinical assessment of dehydration. We know that hypovolemia and dehydration are the words which are used interchangeably, and due to lack of time, we will not debate amongst the two. But why are children more prone to dehydration compared to adults. One important thing is that there is more risk of gastroenteritis in children. Also, their surface area to volume is much higher compared to adults. And finally, because they are small, they are independently may not be able to access the fluid and the calorie intake that an adult can. So all these things make children vulnerable with less safety margin to get dehydrated. Let us understand how we should clinically assess a child suspected of dehydration. The most preferred method is to check for weight. If you have a prior weight, the current weight, compare it with current weight and see the difference. A loss of weight directly, acute loss of weight directly reflects the amount of fluid loss. Generally, we say 3 to 5 percent, less than 3 percent weight loss is no dehydration, 3 to 5 percent is mild dehydration, 6 to 9 percent is moderate dehydration, and more than 10 or more than 10 percent of weight loss is considered severe dehydration. What are the clinical findings that we expect and look out for when we are looking at dehydration? When we are looking at assessing a child for dehydration, after the weight, if you do not have pre-weight and even if you have pre-weight, the next thing that you want to assess is the heart rate. Whenever we see heart rate, we must adjust the increase in heart rate for other factors, for example, associated fever, infection, etc. But dehydration definitely and importantly can be judged and diagnosed by monitoring heart rate. Similarly, Dehydration leads to increase in the respiratory rate as well. To look at skin turgor is the most commonly known method for dehydration. And when we pinch the skin, normally the skin flap, uh, goes back to its normal stage. And this elasticity is known as the skin turgor. Interstitial fluid and subcutaneous fat are the two major components which are responsible for this elasticity. And so when there is dehydration and loss of interstitial fluid, either the skin elasticity gets mildly affected, that means it takes a little while before it goes back to normal and we call it moderate dehydration, or it really takes a long time and almost does not go back to normal and that is what we will call tenting or severe dehydration. Here one caveat is, as we said, the subcutaneous fat is also another component or requirement for maintaining elasticity. So children with either protein energy malnutrition or any medical condition leading to severe wasting and loss of subcute fat, skin turgor is not a reliable sign in order to assess dehydration. Then we look at other signs, especially seen in infants. So for infants, we look at anti if it's depressed or sunken, we look at buccal mucosa and even look at the eyes, whether they are mildly sunken or severely sunken. These different, these are the different parameters which we judge in order to get to this dehydration level. We also look for signs for peripheral vasoconstriction. That means we look at the skin temperature. We compare the core temperature, that means that temperature of the trunk and the temperature of the feet and see if there is a difference in the temperature. That tells us that cold clammy extremities become an important marker for dehydration. Similarly, capillary refill time is normally up to 3 seconds. Any prolongation or abnormal capillary refill time is a serious red flag for dehydration. While we are looking at this, we must always take blood pressure for children who are being assessed for dehydration. Now remember, blood pressure is very late to be affected in children with dehydration. 
and body normally tries to use all parameters in order to maintain the temperature be it increase in the heart rate, respiratory rate or different peripheral vasoconstriction mechanism. We also must look at the dehydration by checking for the urine output and also by asking whether the thirst is there or not there. And finally, always assess the sensorium because any dehydration bad enough to affect the sensorium, you would be worried. When you, when you encounter low blood pressure in a child who is suspected to be having dehydration, always rule out secondary causes, whether there is associated infection, sepsis, dengue fever, etc., which is responsible for hypotension and not dehydration alone. Let us look at some of the special situations in which the classic signs of dehydration are altered. We already discussed that in children with protein energy malnutrition, if we have to assess dehydration, skin turgor is going to be a poor sign. We can look at the weight loss, but again, because they are protein energy malnutrition, their weight gain or weight loss may not be very accurate. So heart rate is the most important factor to monitor. Similarly, children who are in infants who are exclusively breastfed, when they get dehydrated, they usually have loose motions, they usually will lose water and some salt, but the breast milk is having higher salt levels. So if they are replaced with ORS, sometime one could land up with hypernatremic dehydration. Children who are obese and well nourished, you will find signs like skin turgor and Children who are obese, the skin turgor again here, it's a difficult sign to elicit and can be misleading. Depending on the cause, if there is hyponatremia associated with dehydration, the peripheral clinical signs of dehydration are more pronounced. The sunken eyeball, the, uh, the skin turgor and the look of the patient will be more pronounced. On the other hand, in hypernatremic dehydration, skin turgor is going to be less affected and one would tend to underdiagnose or give a milder classification of dehydration. So it's important to realize what is the associated condition and accordingly monitor the patient. When we are looking at this, mild, moderate and severe, all these parameters which we have discussed depending upon how many are affected and how severely are affected, we can grade them into mild, moderate or severe dehydration. WHO has given emergency triage red flags. So cold extremities, prolonged capillary refill time and weak or fast pulses. These are the three red flags which WHO has provided for an emergency assessment. Now, when we do these three, if one or two is affected, we would call it circulatory impairment. But if all three are affected, then the patient would be diagnosed as patient is in shock. Immediately, we must uh, look at the blood pressure. And as we, as we already discussed, if blood pressure is, systolic blood pressure is still maintained within the normal range, you would tend to call it a compensated shock. But if the systolic blood pressure is not maintained within its limit, then you would call it hypovolumic, hypotensive shock. Now, this is a very dangerous situation because this is usually affected with end organ perfusion problems and hence you must look for oliguria, look for any altered sensorium and poor perfusion. You must remember that any child with hypotension can very rapidly deteriorate and requires urgent attention. So friends, when we conclude, we must remember that children are more susceptible to dehydration. We must look at heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, skin turgor, skin temperature and anterior fontanel as well as sunken eyes in order to assess children with dehydration. Weight loss being the most important parameter when you are assessing children with dehydration. Always remember red flags 
in terms of end organ perfusion problem in terms of altered sensorium cold peripheral ex extremities and capillary refill time which is prolonged thank you friends for your kind attention